any employee in any clergy of the Diocese of Burlington are mandatory reporters in almost in every situation that would normally involve a necessity of, of, of reporting abuse. Hi there, it's WAMC News Director Ian Pickus. And on this episode of the WAMC News Podcast, a major shakeup in Northeast Catholic leadership. Well, in June, the Pope announced that Archbishop Christopher Coyne of the Catholic Diocese of Burlington, Vermont, would be reassigned to the Archdiocese of Hartford. When the current Hartford Archbishop retires next year, he will assume that position. Bishop Coyne has led the Burlington Diocese since 2014. He spoke with WAMC North Country Bureau Chief Pat Bradley. Okay, here's that interview. I had heard a lot of rumors and pokes of me from various people, especially within the Conference of Bishops, and saying, well, you know, you're only 65 and you've been in Burlington now for eight years, so they're probably going to move you. And I kept saying, well, don't do me any favors. I like where I am and all that. So I, 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 was, I was aware that there was some rumblings here and there, but in terms of where and when and how, I had no idea until I received a phone call uh, from the uh, papal ambassador, uh, um, Cardinal uh, Christoph Pierre. Now, this was announced earlier in the summer. How familiar have you become with Hartford, and what will you be doing as co-adjutor, Archbishop? Yeah, co-adjutor, co-adjutor, co-adjutor. Um, it's pronounced correctly both ways. I, I'm basically got about five or six months uh, until the Archbishop retires in April. Spent a lot of time just getting to know people and get out and about to the various churches and parishes and religious communities and works that are going on. So it's a it's a great opportunity to actually have the time to get out and get to meet all those different peoples and, and works that they're doing before I actually take on the responsibility of administration and teaching and sacraments and all that. Um, so I... I have I am familiar with Hartford more and more through talking to various people who work there um, and also being out and about, um, you know, on, online and looking, look, reading about it. And they gave me a very fine report on the uh, state of the archdiocese. Um, just as in this personal side, I, I had to have surgery on my ankle. So I've been laid up for five, six weeks now so I could put weight on it. So that I haven't been able to get out and, and geographically wander. So I've been wandering through the Internet, so to speak. Is Hartford similar to the Diocese of Burlington, where Burlington is the entire state of Vermont? No, Hartford is actually only three counties in Connecticut. Um, and the, it, basically its geography is pretty much right down the middle of the state with... Um, the diocese of Norwich to the to the east, and down in the southwest corner towards New York, where there's a lot of population, the diocese of Bridgeport. But then it, it also kind of curves up to the to the uh, to the northwest corner in an area that's very rural, uh, much like a lot of, of Vermont is. So, while there's a great deal more of urban um, churches and urban and cities and all that, there still is a significant part of the archdiocese that's in many ways very similar to Vermont in terms of these small, smaller towns, smaller churches um, that are struggling in many ways to, to remain open because of changes in demographics, uh, lack of employment, all those things that we struggle with at times here in Vermont. Well, you mentioned some of the struggles. I mean, Catholic dioceses have also had other challenges. In Vermont, you've seen a uh, former cathedral in the downtown. Uh, it's slated for demolition. You merged it with another cathedral. It's a little unusual to have two cathedrals in one city. Do you find that with the challenges, as you mentioned, attendance and lack of worker availability, do you think either Burlington or Hartford risk bankruptcy at this point? No, I, uh, here in, Bur- in the Diocese of Burlington, we, we are financially stable. Uh, we're trying. We, there's some cases that are that are pending against us since the statute of limitations was removed, but we're working towards uh, mediation and also towards settlement. Don't want to go to um, court 
on these matters for all kinds of reasons. But right now, we have the wherewithal to settle if uh, if we can negotiate the asking prices into a more reasonable place. Uh, uh, that can happen without having to, to actually go into bankruptcy. So the, the Diocese of Burlington is fairly stable. Now, the Dutch Diocese of Hartford is much more financially stable. Uh, that state has not removed its statute of limitations on abuse of children um, by priests or by school teachers or anybody or any adult. Um, and because of that, um, the, they did settle the cases way back when, but there hasn't been a this look back yet. And I don't, hopefully I don't see it happening, but the, from what I know from looking at the report from the Archdiocese, they're financially very stable. However, they're still overcharged, um, and that's something that needs to be addressed because the Archbishop there now, Archbishop Blair, merged a number of parishes into one parish. So you'd have three or four churches in one town or city, and now there are only one parish instead of three separate parishes. But you still, in those places, you still have three buildings, three churches, and that's not sustainable either. So that's where the work is going to be, I think, more than anything else in terms of administration is how do you help these local parishes that are now one parish with three or four buildings to make decisions as to which buildings stay open and which close? You don't want to be putting all of your efforts into maintaining infrastructure when it really needs to go into the mission, which is to serve people, to serve the poor, and to care for and to you know proclaim the good news. It sounds like a lot of the issues that you are going to face in Hartford are similar to what you see in, in Burlington and what I've heard in some of the dioceses even here in New York State. Yeah, it's um, like, well, you are up in northern, I think you're in northern New York. Yes. Right? And in rural, in Vermont, what it was, a lot of these small town parishes were created because there were the farming communities around there. And they had to be set up so that people could get back and forth within a reasonable amount of time before the car, before you had an automobile. So each of these little parishes had, these little towns had parish churches with, you know, large families, usually 150 to 200 different people. Sometimes they had schools, uh, much like they were in upper New York. Um, and what happens is that a lot of those farms are no longer there. A lot of those large families are no longer there. And a lot of people are no longer there. And people can now drive to uh, other churches in the area. So when you look at the need to sustain some of these small parishes and small, and small towns, it's it's important to sustain it because it does have a cultural effect in terms of the life of the parish, not just the parish, but also the community itself. You know, some places I've closed, people have said the last building standing basically in our downtown is the Catholic Church, so please don't close it. But then you say, well, what does that say when all the other businesses and everything else have left for their own reasons? The same reasons that they left are the same ones that the church struggles with. But we do have declining membership, and that's also something that's not, not a matter of demographics either. Bishop Coyne, you uh, alluded to the accusations of sexual assault uh, by priests in the diocese and that you're working towards mediation in the ones that have gone to court. Do you anticipate that there will be more accusations that your successor will have to deal with? I hope not. Um, you know, no one wants to have these stories get unearthed, and, and, uh, and because they work, they are truly horrific. And I, and, and you know, and then you see, I sit and I listen to them, and I, I, I know, and they're, they're, and I believe the people, I believe them, and so we try and do what we can to give justice to them, while also trying to maintain. You know, when you're dealing with twelve different cases, you can't, you have to be, you have to make sure that you take care of everyone that's that's making a claim against you. You just can't give a, a significant sum to one person and not have them any left over at the end for the others. But I hope not. Um, Vermont has been pretty uh, blessed, uh, if you want to say that, uh, in that uh, the number of cases against the clergy in Vermont, in terms of a portion of the number of clergy, is much smaller than that in, in other places throughout the country. So the number of cases that have had to been settled are fewer. But they still need to be settled. They still need to be taken care of. Uh, but you know, we could settle all the 12 or 14 cases that we have now, and then another two or three could appear because there's no statute of limitations. So I can't guarantee anything. But I'm trying to do everything that we can to do be, to do justice to people while also trying to maintain the integrity of, of the ability of the church in Vermont to do its works. You have been bishop since uh, 2014, which means you have been here 
when the news and the investigations into the abuse decades ago at the former St. Joseph's Orphanage in Burlington came to light. What role have you and the diocese played in providing continued restitution for the survivors of the orphanage? And do you believe that the diocese should continue funding therapy for the survivors? We've, we've always said continuously throughout this whole, um, whether we're dealing with abuse, uh, children, men and women who are dealing with the fallout of abuse in a parish or whether it was at the orphanage, that we would be, we, we do provide funding for therapy if that's what they need, if, that, if that's an important part of what can, is going to help them um, deal with the issues that arose from um, the horrible situations and, and abuse that they suffered. Um, the orphanage situation, the orphanage closed in 1974. The story that broke on the Internet really was a recapitulation of, of uh, stories that had been carried in the, in the Burlington Free Press back in the 1990s. So it was, a, it was a generation later, and all of a sudden the story erupts, and, and all these things come forward, which had already come forward previously. And there had been settlements and legal settlements back then with the victims of the orphanage. Um, so when this broke and, it, and people and there was concerns that were raised about it, I ordered and not ordered, but I worked with Vermont Catholic Charities and uh, and also the investigative committee set up by the Attorney General of the state to provide freely all of our access to all of our uh, records regarding the orphanage that we had. So we we didn't have anybody. There was no legal requirement. There was no. No judge said we had to provide these things. We said, we want to be work with you. We want to get to the bottom of this. We want to resolve this. And so my staff in Vermont Catholic Charities worked with the investigation of the Attorney General's office for almost a year and a half, two years. A lot of work, a lot of records. And then they provided their report. We also worked with the Burlington Police Department because there were accusations of uh, murders at the uh, orphanage, you know, claims that children had heard that three ch three children of this child had been murdered by a nun, all these kind of really, um, you know, awful stories. Um, so the police were involved, and they did an investigation, and they said there's no missing, ch according to the records, there are no missing children. They're all accounted for. According to the records, there's nothing that leads to any kind of a suspicion of a murder. Whatever these stories, wherever these stories are coming from, there's no proof whatsoever. Um, but because there was no, they couldn't make a, dis, a complete finding in this matter. They said, at this point, there's, there's nothing we can do because there's no evidence of a wrongdoing. There's no evidence of anything along these lines, and so we find that there's no evidence that these murders actually com were committed. So, I mean, I'm getting very verbal about all these things, but the fact is, at the end of the day, there was nothing really new that came out of the report that hadn't been there before, and that the cases had been settled legally before. And when the former orphans came forward and said, well, they want more restitution, we just couldn't do it because we were in the middle of trying to make restitution to people who haven't received any restitution, um, namely the cases of those involved in abuse. As I said to them, we don't have the funding to do that, but we can help you in terms of counseling. If you want to meet with me as the bishop, I do, which I've done with numerous ones of them, we'll help you that way. But we can't start going back and looking at legal settlements and legal documents and you know signing off and saying, that you, you know, can make no longer claims against the diocese. So we do that, then we're opening a can of warrants for everybody. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, at the end of the day, it, what happened to those children in the orphanage uh, was, a, was a whole conflation of all kinds of different things. You know, children who came from broken homes, children who came from outrageous situations, children who just dropped at the door, um, and then, you know, children, and then they, and then they suffered the harshness of the, uh, of the environment there. Um, and, you know, it was all added on to a lot of things. And all I can say is I just do everything I can to help them heal, but we can't provide the kind of restitution in the sense of funding that they want. Bishop Coyne, you have been saying that you support helping victims of child abuse and neglect. But uh, in March, you testified in the Vermont Senate, the Judiciary Committee, against Senate Bill 16, which is, let's see, an act relating to repealing the exception for clergy to report child abuse and neglect, which uh, would require people who go into the confessional 
and confess that they've done child abuse. Why did you testify against priests reporting that? Well, let me start off by saying any employee and any clergy of the Diocese of Burlington are mandatory reporters in almost in every situation that would normally involve a necessity of, of, of reporting abuse. So we all have to go through criminal background checks. We all have to go through training. And then we all are mandatory reporters. In the situation involving the confession, you're talking about worship. It's, it's the worship of the church. It's when someone comes and the priest is there mainly as a vehicle to listen to them. But it's a long-standing tradition of confidentiality that anyone can come into the confessional, whether it's the Catholic president of the United States or a Catholic head of state, wherever they may be, or, or just the, the smallest and in the, in the, in the smallest and the, in the least of the, of, uh, of the person who comes to church. What they share in the confession to the priest is, is basically speaking and opening themselves up to God's mercy and God's love and providing that through the priest himself. And the priest is bound by confidentiality. He cannot, in fact, break that seal. It's a, and it's also part of the church's worship. It's part of what we do. It's part of what we believe. This state would be one of only, it was only, the only one that comes close to it is Texas as to uh, removing the, vow, the seal of confession. Um, but Texas also removed the, the, uh, the confidentiality of, of lawyer privilege as well involving children, abusive children. So what I was just testifying to was the fact that we want to maintain the integrity of the church's worship and that there is no, there's no way in which a priest can violate that because of the vow that he made to his, his own faith and his own church. And so to ask us to pass a law to do that is to ask us to do something that we can't do. If I recall, there's some severe repercussions for the priest through the church if you do violate it. There is. He would be suspended, and he can only be returned to ministry by an action of the Pope himself. That's how strongly and the tradition has been held throughout the centuries. You know, you just can't violate it. And I can say abusers do not come to confession. They don't... Uh, come into the confessional and tell the priest these things. It's just the nature of, of the abuser. He, he or she just is not psychologically, they just don't do that. And, you know, uh, I, and I'm not breaking the seal of saying I just have never heard uh, in, in all of my years of any kind of a case like this that, uh, that you know, there's where something has been testified or made known in confession that you can't react to or do something about. You can with, uh, well, I could withhold you have what they call the, the uh, absolution, in which there's a prayer in which, just through the priest, this person's sins are forgiven. If they, if there's something serious like that, and they're not going to do anything about it, and they're not going to stop doing, it, you can you can say, well, I can't give you absolution. They can't possibly give you God's forgiveness. So why are you here? You know, what are you seeking? Kind of a rock and a hard place for priests in that situation. Yeah, but honestly, it's not. It's not something that, we, that you tend to that encounter. Even when I was in Boston and I was dealing with all the, with, when I was there as the spokesperson and I, we were dealing with all those cases, of all the priests that were accused, there was only one that ever said he did it. And, and then he went away and he spent a life of penance and prayer since. The rest of them just would refuse to, to acknowledge that, in fact, they had done something, even when the evidence was clearly there. You'd meet with them and they'd say, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. They just wouldn't say it. It was... It was a uh, very frustrating one. Bishop Coyne, we've been talking about some rather dark issues here, but what do you feel are your accomplishments in your time in Burlington? Well, I, I, lots of good things. I think, um, you know, while we merged a number of parishes, um, and that was a sad moment for a lot of people to see their churches close. It also helped to bring together people in, to a much more vibrant and alive place so that when they would come to a church now, they'd find many more people there, much more uh, resources. So that's a, that there's, while there's been some movement and, and consolidation, what you've ended up with is a place that's alive, much more um, able to take care of itself, maintain itself, and, and, and celebrate its life in terms of not just its worship, but also the good works that it does. I'm also very pleased with the fact that we're we pretty much are one of the, pro the largest provider, private provider of social services 
in the state of Vermont through the fact that every one of our churches has some kind of an outreach involving a food bank or collections or providing um, extra kind of help for people who are in need. To our Vermont Catholic Charity, we provide emergency shelter and emergency aid as we can, um, depending on until we run out of money each month, but we just try and do the best we can. So I'm very proud of the fact that we as Catholics in Vermont continue to do what we always do, which is celebrate our faith and worship together, but also continue to just reach out to those who are on the margins and those who are needy, irregardless of whether they share our faith or they share our, or even if they're, you know, they're just new people to the community. We take care of these people. Um, During COVID, while we did have to close our churches for the six weeks, Mm -hmm. like everyone else, we were able to still provide services through internet streaming and online, helping people as we could and connecting with people in the way that we did. And then in our Catholic schools, when when the COVID um, was lifted in terms of what was required in terms of shutdown, our Catholic schools were able to open and and have children in the classrooms when the public schools weren't for over a whole year without our having to close down or any of our schools, without having an outbreak of COVID because of all the good work that they did. So I'm very proud of that. And then when you look at some of our churches, they're starting to grow again. The Cathedral Church, where I celebrate a lot of times, Um, There are more people coming to the cathedral now than there were pre-COVID, and it's a very diverse community with people from the Congo, from Burundi, from Vietnam, and then a lot of the local families that are coming back. The churches that have been consolidated, and I'm very proud of that, and I'm also very proud of my staff. I mean, the people that I've hired, the people that I work with, they're just just stellar, and the priests are great, too. So those are the things that I I, I take with me, and, and I've always enjoyed being with them, and they with me, I think, for the most part. You know, those are the things I'm proud of. I'm proud of the fact that we still are able to preach the good news of the Catholic Church in a state that's the least religious one in the country. All right, that does it for this episode of the WAMC News Podcast. Thanks so much to Pat Bradley for that interview, and thanks to you, as always, for listening. Until next time, I'm Ian Pickus.